Hi everyone, Michael here, Vegan Space Scientist. It's been a little over a week since Jonathan Safran Foer's The End of Me Is Here opinion piece came out in the New York Times, and I did a response video to that at the time, and I said in that video that if there were any substantive criticisms of the article, then I would do a uh, another response video to that. At the time, it was mostly just some offhand social media comments, which I addressed a few of, and a few videos from pro-carnivore diet folks on YouTube. So I didn't think there was much substantive content to cover. However, now North American Meat Institute has written a response to this. So I'm going to be addressing that here. First, a little bit about NAMI and what they are. I'll just read their highlighted about section. NAMI is a national trade association that represents companies that process 95% of red meat and 70% of turkey products in the US and their suppliers throughout America. Now their Wikipedia page does not state that they're a lobby group. It says that they are a nonprofit industry trade association. They're based in Washington, DC. Uh, I don't quite know what the difference is or why they haven't used the word lobby group, but it sounds like they're, they're pretty similar. They're an industry representative group. So with that out of the way, let's get into the article. I want to keep this video pretty brief because I do have another video I'm working on for this weekend, but for now let's just uh, read the whole thing and have some comments as we go. Like many sectors of the economy, meat and poultry has been challenged during the COVID crisis. This leads to the popular pundit sport of writing the industry's eulogy. The most recent comes from vegetarian and author Jonathan Safran Foer here in the New York Times. So I believe they initially wrote this as a response to Jonathan Safran Foer, they were seemingly not successful in getting that published in the New York Times. That's just for context, that's not a criticism because I've written many responses for op-eds and have not had one published yet. Safran Foer says COVID-19 has shown that for Americans, the end of me is here. They're commenting a little bit, I guess, that the title is a little bit hyperbolic and sure, I'd agree that it is. We're still a long way from the end of me being here. From the start of the pandemic, it was clear Meat is essential to Americans. Consumers were flooding grocery stores and buying necessities. Meat was among the few key items like toilet paper and hand sanitizer, which they bought immediately and in historically high quantities. Look, I haven't seen the stats on these, and maybe the American context is different to the Australian context, but I don't think it was just animal products that were being purchased uh, in high quantities. I think we saw lots of things like rice, like flour, like beans, canned goods, long life foods. So there are a lot of things, and I, I have to admit, I'm not like I'd go past the meat section paying close attention. I don't recall noticing the meat section being particularly out of stock. I remember seeing a lot of signs about being only able to buy, say, one long life soy milk. So, I mean, they haven't provided a reference here or anything. Uh, I don't have evidence to the counter other than my own anecdotal experience. I'm just skeptical of that. Meat continues to experience record demand. One thing I will say is uh, something I will link below is the number of plant-based meat sales has gone up enormously in the last few months. Is that because the sales of all products have been going up because people are stocking up? I'm not sure, but that's just a counterpoint that they haven't recognized. This brought all of us in the food supply chain from farmers to retailers great pride that our products are a source of comfort for Americans, comfort in their safety, nutrition, and value for families in time of need. Catherine Foer says, if you care about the working poor, you will not eat meat. Meat packers and processors employ over 500,000 people these men and women work hard, earn a good wage, and are an essential part of rural communities thanks to the meat they produce. And there is nothing wrong with that. Now, I think they're missing the point here. They've completely bypassed the entire argument Saffron Foer was making about the impact of these industries on, on the workers themselves, So, particularly with the COVID situation. Because these workers are working in such confined quarters, they're highly susceptible to spreading coronavirus. I don't believe that the organizations and companies are taking anywhere near the level of safety precautions that they need to be taking. Just for one point of reference in the US, 0.5% of the population as of a few weeks ago had um, been infected with coronavirus versus 8% of the meatpacking industry. That is a huge difference. So let alone the higher injury rate in the industry, the way the workers are treated, the fact that the communities affected by the environmental impact of these industries are mostly minorities. For example, the fact that it's fairly standard practice for a pig farm to spray feces into the air in the area around they operate to dispose of it and this of course is breathed in by the local population. I don't know if Saffron Fell particularly talked about this but I certainly would be advocating for helping these people to transition to better jobs to increase their working standards and to protect the workers in general rather than propping up an industry that is causing so much suffering to animals and also to the humans who work on it. 
Saffron Foa says, Americans have always known meat was bad for the planet and bad for our health. He says the COVID-19 has kicked open the door to this knowledge. Actually, the pandemic has shown us the opposite. One of the most significant impacts of the pandemic on our world is the environment. Research published in the journal Nature suggests that the global greenhouse gas emissions have dropped 17% over the last two months. Our air is the cleanest it has been in decades, and the reasons are clear. Fewer cars on the road, planes in the air, ships at sea. And yet there is the same number of livestock in the countryside. Research into how animal agriculture can not only reduce its carbon footprint, but leave it completely neutral is ongoing and promising. There's a lot to unpack here. Okay, let's give this a go. First, yes, emissions have gone down in recent times. That is partly because of transport. It's partly because of energy consumption being a lot lower. Sure, there are roughly the same number of animals in agriculture at this point in time. However, so what? I mean, no one ever claimed that the other industries don't have an impact. Imagine if a situation occurred where the number of animals in farms dropped by, say, 50%, and the transport industry, the energy industry remained about the same. If emissions therefore dropped, do you think it would be strange for the transport industry to say, hey, look at the animal agriculture industry? The emissions have dropped. Therefore, we don't have a problem. No one ever said that the emissions are only from animal agriculture. So this just seems strange. On to the last sentence about not only reducing the carbon footprint of the industry, but leaving it completely neutral. For it to be completely neutral, the net emissions would have to be zero. One of the only ways to get it to true net zero is to offset your emissions by doing something else. And typically that means carbon capture and storage. So whether you're physically capturing carbon from the air and putting it in the ground, or you are, say, just planting trees. These are ways to offset the carbon in the industry. The reason it's pretty much impossible to get to neutral without doing that is you're always going to emit some emissions into the air, regardless of any activity that you do. And unless you're capturing those and putting them back in the ground, then it can't be neutral. So you have to be doing something to offset that. So look, there's no references here. Um, I'm not going to harp on about that. Um, that's obviously the path they've chosen to take, so fine. But I will say this is something we see often mentioned by the fossil fuel industry. They say things like, theoretically, the fossil fuel industry can reduce its emissions, that we can even potentially get to a neutral emission scenario. And that is theoretically true. We could have carbon capture and storage where you physically capture the emissions at, say, a coal plant or a gas plant. Instead of releasing them into the air as a standard practice, you capture them, you put them in the ground. I have heard from at least one person who is a researcher in this industry who has asked to remain anonymous that he thinks this technology is not feasible economically. Obviously, because I can't point to any research, take that with a grain of salt. But people remain critical of the industry despite this. And they say that, well, instead of pursuing that route, can't we just look at other energy alternatives? And so I'd say the same thing for animal agriculture. Instead of pursuing that route, can't we look at eating plants directly instead? In fact, according to the CLIA Center at UC Davis, U.S. farmers and ranchers are the most advanced in the world. Efficiencies have led to significantly lower carbon footprint per animal over the past 70 years. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Statistical Database, total direct greenhouse gas emissions from U.S. livestock have declined 11.3% since 1961, while livestock production has more than doubled. So this quote is kind of interesting. I thought, you know, let's go and verify that. And I just copied the quote and I thought, let's try and just paste that into Google and see what comes up. And then we'll try and directly look for it in the FAO database. When I pasted that quote in, almost verbatim, I see the same quote coming from a number of other websites. So this article from the conversation in 2018, pretty much verbatim has the same sentence. Then this is a Senate testimony document from 2019. And it says pretty much verbatim the same thing. If this was an academic paper, this would be plagiarism. Like the wording is the same. It's not just the saying the same thing. The, the way they've said it is identical almost. References to these will, of course, be below. Now, I had a quick look at the FAO database. It's not trivial to pull out the this kind of information. Uh, I, I could do it, I guess. It would take some work. But look, let's take that for granted. So why would this have come about? This testimony here talks about efficiencies in reproduction, better health, brought about by vaccines, advances in healthcare genetics, and so on, energy-dense diets. What we're talking about here is, in short, growing animals faster. I would argue that this is largely a reflection of the fact that animals in agriculture are bred now to grow so fast that their bodies are unable to keep up. So we see, for example, with chickens, they grow so fast that their organs give out, their legs give way, their bones become quite brittle. And in terms of animal welfare, this is an enormous problem. Maybe you can say it's a win environmentally, but is it worth it? I don't think so. And just on this, I want to say that the emissions from fossil fuels in the US has also gone down. 
over the last few decades. This is largely from advancements in technology as well. In particular, the shale gas revolution, where techniques like hydraulic fracturing were used more. This led to an increased supply in gas into the energy market. And because gas has less emissions per unit energy produced than, say, coal, this led to a reduction in emissions. Does this mean that we should just ignore the industry now and it's all good? I don't think so. I think we should still be transitioning from fossil fuels to other energy sources. And I'd argue the same thing here with animal agriculture. Meanwhile, meat's nutrition sustains us. While vegetarian and vegan diets can be a choice for some people, they're not necessarily affordable or easy. I can't disagree more. I think Jonathan Sacrin Power covered this in his, in his article just fine. I don't think this is a reasonable rebuttal. They haven't actually provided anything substantive here. But just to quickly expand on it, a lot of fruits, vegetables, beans, lentils, rice, these things are quite cheap compared to a lot of animal products. If you want to look at going to expensive vegan restaurants or buying fake meat products, sure, maybe it can be more expensive. But you don't have to do that. There's a reason why in developing nations, as they continue to develop, the per capita meat consumption goes up and not down. To get the same level of protein, iron, vitamin B12, zinc, niacin, and other nutrients as a single serving of meat, people need to eat multiple replacements with a calorie cost that adds up fast. Protein from meat also helps satiate us to reduce total calories we consume in a day. Boy, I said I wouldn't harp on about references, but they just made a lot of claims here without a single reference. Uh, look, I'll, I'll just pick out a couple here. So protein, it's pretty hard to be deficient in protein unless you are not consuming enough calories. Not impossible, but it's, it's pretty hard. Plants have protein in them and you don't really need that much protein unless you're trying to build muscle mass. Even if you are, you can still get enough protein on a plant-based diet. The vitamin B12, this one comes up a lot because yes, vegans should be supplementing vitamin B12, whether that's through a supplemented soy milk as I get my vitamin B12 from, or from a tablet or from a uh, tongue spray or something like that. So it is the case that because vitamin B12 is almost exclusively made by bacteria found in dirt, we do need to find alternative sources. But I hear you say, hang on a second, people who eat animal products don't need to supplement B12. But actually, they usually do without realizing it because often animals prior to slaughter will be injected with B12. Some animals do produce some B12 of their own, some ruminant animals, for example. However, there are issues with even them producing enough B12. And so, for example, a lot of uh, livestock have to be supplemented with cobalt in their diet so that they can actually absorb enough B12 so that humans can get enough B12 from eating them. Look, I'm not a medical scientist. I could go ahead and reference some things and maybe I'll leave some links below about the nutrition of a plant-based diet. I will say that most national health guidelines do admit that a well-managed, well-planned, plant-based vegan diet can be healthy. Indeed, just as healthy as any other animal product consuming diet. Meat also sustains Americans in the communities in which they live. Meat is affordable. Americans spend just 9.7% of their disposable income on food, less than most other nations. Perhaps Saffron Fowler should ask the hundreds of thousands of farmers and ranchers in our great country about the value and role meat has in their lives. Perhaps NAMI should be asking that question to the billions of animals that we exploit and torture for their flesh. As I said, I don't think meat is particularly affordable compared to a lot of plant-based products. You could turn to the millions of restaurateurs who are struggling right now, but recognize the importance of meat on their menus to the success of their businesses. And finally, he could speak to the retailers who have experienced firsthand the value of meat for their stores and their customers. I don't know what to say about this. I mean, you could put the short-term interests of animal farmers ahead of the animals. Okay, I just think that that's unethical. Again, we should be helping these people transition to new industries, whether it's the farmers themselves or the suppliers or the restaurants because this is a unsustainable industry. And I think governments actually owe it to the industry to not prop them up indefinitely until we get to a tipping point. I think we have to start shifting now. Remarkably, Saffron Foa goes on to assert that animal agriculture causes pandemics, although the precise origin of COVID-19 is still being determined. Ongoing research continues to confirm that domestic livestock production is safe and has not played a role in the spread of COVID-19. Uh, okay, kind of missing the point. Well, let's just read the last part. Current evidence points to a journey from wild animals to humans, which aligns with the prevailing scientific evidence that 72% of zoonotic diseases originate in wildlife. Sure, so they're, they're kind of missing the point. I don't think Saffron Foll is really arguing that COVID-19 has come from industrialized animal agriculture in developed nations. It came from probably wild animals or a wet market or some combination of those two in Wuhan, China. But the point is zoonotic diseases 
can and do actually start in factory farms all the time. Swine flu came from pig farming operations, and we've had avian flus come from chicken farming operations. So this does happen, and I think it still is just a matter of time before a major pandemic like SARS-CoV-2 does actually come from industrialized animal agriculture. I don't know where that 72% of zoonotic diseases comes from, but that still doesn't leave you much confidence because 28% is remaining. Even if it's just 28%, if we can do something about that by rolling back animal agriculture, I think we should. As meat packers and processors work to protect their employees and keep the supply chain moving, one thing is very clear to all in this pandemic. Americans may be questioning what the future holds for our way of life, but contrary to Safran Foer's assertions, they aren't questioning what food is essential. They know meat deserves its place at the center of the plate, nourishing our families in this pandemic and into the future. They didn't cover animal welfare, animal rights, one little bit, not even a nod. That was a pretty major part of Safran Foer's article and I can't say I'm too surprised. I'm a little bit surprised because it's a criticism that they could have addressed. The fact that they didn't address it out of everything makes me think that they didn't feel confident in addressing it to the best of their abilities and so they decided it would be strategically better to leave it. That's rampant speculation but I I do wonder why they didn't cover that. If people aren't questioning what food is essential, why are more Americans and more people around the world buying plant-based animal product alternatives. Anyway, I'll leave it there and thank you for watching. Hmm, National Hot Dog Day. In the spirit of filling the substantial need for high quality protein in our communities, we are partnering with Feeding America on National Hot Dog Day. High quality protein, hot dogs.